In this video, we're going to review one of the most misunderstood rules in baseball, infield flies. We'll start the video by reviewing the definition for an infield fly, and after that, we'll work through the quiz to help you better understand how these rules apply to your game. Now, if you wanna see how well you can do on this week's quiz before going through the review with me, you can find a link to it in the video description. Hi everyone, Patrick Farber from GHSA Baseball, Umpire Development and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires develop their knowledge and skills. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out the rest of our videos. Also, if you want next week's case plays emailed to you, there's a link in the description to sign up. Now let's start by breaking down the definition of an infield fly. Rule 2-19. An infield fly is a fair fly, not including a line drive, nor an attempted bunt, which can be caught by an infielder with ordinary effort. The rule does not preclude outfielders from being allowed to attempt to make the catch. And provided the hit is made before two are out, and at a time when first and second bases or all bases are occupied. So let's break that down into three different requirements for an infield fly. First, we note that an infield fly must be fair. Also, it must be a fly ball, which is defined in rule 2-6-2. A fly ball is a batted ball which rises an appreciable height above the ground. Now, by rule, any batted ball can qualify as a fly ball, However, the infield fly rule specifies that a line drive or bunt does not qualify for this rule. The second requirement is that the ball can be caught by an infielder with ordinary effort. Now, ordinary effort is a somewhat vague term, but here's the best way to think of it. Could the average infielder at this level catch this ball? So after this, the rule adds in that the rule does not preclude outfielders from being allowed to attempt to make the catch. This is most likely to occur when we have a high fly hit into the shallow outfield that the infielder can get under. However, they are called off by the outfielder. In this scenario, if you believe the infielder was likely going to be able to make the play with ordinary effort, then we still have an infield fly. Finally, the third requirement is that the infield fly occur when there are less than two outs and first and second or first, second, and third are occupied. The reason for this part of the requirement is that the infield fly rule is designed to prevent a team from being able to turn a cheap double play. Obviously, with two outs, they wouldn't be able to turn a double play. And with bases loaded or a first and second, we expect the runners on an infield fly to stay at their base for a potential tag up. The defense expects the same, so if they allowed the ball to drop, the runners would still be at their original base, and the defense would have plenty of time to throw the ball to multiple bases for a double or triple play. That's why this rule is so important. Now, the definition continues with a note for umpires. When it seems apparent that a batted ball will be an infield fly, the umpire immediately announces it for the benefit of the runners. If the ball is near baseline, the umpire shall declare infield fly if fair. Let's start with that the definition lays out exactly who the rule protects, base runners. This goes back to the logic I gave you before around what situations this applies to. We are trying to prevent the defense from turning a cheap double play on the runners already on base. The rule continues by giving us the proper vocal mechanic for an infield fly. When it is going to come down in fair territory, we yell infield fly. Then when we have an infield fly that could potentially land foul, we should yell infield fly if fair. Note though that if you only yell infield fly and then the ball still becomes foul, you have not ruled it fair and you are still able to call the ball foul, which supersedes the infield fly rule. Now, a key point to the definition of an infield fly is that the only information given about the ball relative to the field is that it must be in fair territory. Otherwise, there is no mention of its location on the field or relative to the infield dirt. So long as the infielder can catch the ball with ordinary effort, it qualifies for an infield fly. And the reverse of this is true as well. If the infield fly is hit during a defensive shift and no infielder is able to catch the ball with ordinary effort, then it is not an infield fly, even if the ball does land in the dirt of the infield. So now that we've defined an infield fly, let's review the results of it. Rule 8-4-1J. The batter runner is out when he hits an infield fly and the infield fly rule is in effect. So when we have an infield fly, the batter runner is out, which means there will not be a force out on the other runners because they won't lose their right to the base due to a batter runner. Also, this rule does not remove their need to retouch when a caught batted ball is first touched and the ball remains live and in play. So now that we've reviewed the rules, let's cover this week's case plays. Case play number one. In what situations can an infield fly occur? So the first aspect we look for is how many outs there are. Anytime there's less than two outs, we can have an infield fly. But if there's two outs, there's no possibility of an infield fly. After that, we look at where the runners are on base. 
Remember, an infield fly can only occur when there are runners on first and second or first, second, and third. Case play number two. Can an infielder catch an infield fly in the outfield? The correct answer here is yes. The infield fly rule applies whenever an infielder can catch the ball with ordinary effort. Case play number three. Can an outfielder catch an infield fly? The correct answer here is yes. So long as we believe that an infielder would have also been able to make the catch with ordinary effort, then an outfielder can catch an infield fly. Case play number four. Can a bunt be an infield fly? The correct answer here is no. By rule, a bunt cannot be an infield fly. Case play number five. Who does an infield fly benefit? The batter, the runners, the defense, or all of the above? The correct answer here is the runners. The rule even goes on to say that the runners are specifically who's benefited by the call of an infield fly. Case play number six. An infield fly is A, an immediate dead ball, B, a delayed dead ball, C, a live ball. The correct answer here is C. An infield fly is a live ball. Case play number seven. In an infield fly situation, the umpire calls infield fly, but the ball curves into foul territory and lands foul. Is this A, the batter is out, or B, this is a foul ball? The correct answer here is B, this is a foul ball. Remember, a foul ball always supersedes an infield fly. Case play number eight. With a runner on third base and two outs, B1 hits a fly ball in the infield that should be caught by F4 with ordinary effort. U1 incorrectly calls out infield fly and the batter runner does not attempt to advance to first. The ball is then unintentionally not caught by F4, but he picks the ball up and throws the ball to first base. Is this A, the batter runner is out for hitting an infield fly, B, the batter runner is out on a force out at first base, C, the batter runner is safe because he didn't attempt to advance due to the umpire's mistake, or D, call time and start over from scratch. The correct answer here is B, and it comes from the casebook directly. The casebook lays out very clearly that players are just as responsible for recognizing and identifying an infield fly situation as the umpires. So if the umpires accidentally call an infield fly when they shouldn't, the players are still expected to play on as though it hadn't been called in the first place. So in this scenario, the rules expect that the batter runner will still attempt to advance to first, even though an infield fly was incorrectly called. Case play number nine. With R2 on second and R1 on first and no outs, B3 hits an infield fly, or what by rule is an infield fly. But neither umpire calls infield fly due to poor judgment or forgetting the situation. The defense then lets the ball drop without touching it and throws the ball to third and second base while the runners do not try to advance. The play ends with R2 on second and R1 and the batter runner on first. Is it A? R2 and R1 are out on a force out, batter runner stays at first. B, batter is out, R2 and R1 remain at second and first respectively. Or C, all three are out. The correct answer here is B. This is an infield fly regardless of whether or not the umpires correctly rule it at the time. The umpires can go back and even change this call after it happens to change a play to an infield fly. So in this situation, the infield fly occurs regardless of what the umpires say. So we have an infield fly, that makes the batter runner out, and then the other runners aren't forced to advance. So they'll stay at second and first while the batter runner will be out. Case play number 10, which will tell you if a ball is an infield fly. The ball, the fielders, your partner, the TV announcers. The correct answer here is B. The infielders are the only ones that will tell you whether or not they can catch a ball with ordinary effort. Looking up at the ball doesn't tell you whether or not it can be caught with ordinary effort. And remember, the only thing that matters with the position of the ball is that it comes down in fair territory and not foul. But to read ordinary effort, we need to look at the infielders and see how they're preparing to catch this batted ball. If you see the infielder starting to square up to the plate or back to the infield, this means they're probably getting ready to camp underneath it. But if you see them turn around and sprinting away from you to try to catch this ball, then it's probably not going to be caught with ordinary effort, and thus we would not have an infield fly. But again, the only way for you to tell is by looking at the fielders and not the ball. Case play number 11. With less than two outs and runners on first and second, an infield fly is hit to F4 and is catchable with ordinary effort. The plate umpire sees his partner is not properly identifying the ball as an infield fly. Can the plate umpire initiate this call? The correct answer here is yes. The plate umpire can initiate the call or the base umpire. Now, ideally we wanna leave it to the partner that would normally have this coverage area for a catch, no catch. But if we see that our partner might not get it and we know that we'd get it correct, 
then go ahead and step up and make this call. Also, anytime we have an infield fly, the other umpires need to echo the umpire that makes the call. So for example, in this play, if the plate umpire does step up and call it, the base umpire doesn't have a choice at this point. They need to go along with them and echo the infield fly call. So there you have it, our review of infield flies. If you found this video helpful for you or your association, I'm always looking for ideas for new videos or topics you would like to see covered. So feel free to send them my way in the comments or via email. Thanks again for watching. And as always, I look forward to seeing you on the field.